Today I'm at a floating home orange not to show you yet another floating home that's for sale or even the inside of a floating home orange behind the gates and down the ramp and on the docks but instead from the sides and from behinds a few floating homes to show you what the parts are to a typical float and also we'll take a quick peek at a concrete float. We'll cover the chains that are required, what stringers are, what types of logs are used and so on, and what the things are that a float inspector will look for. It's important for a float to pass, actually it's required that a float pass a float inspection for a floating home lender to make a loan to buy a floating home. Let's take a look. The float is a pretty simple thing that's under a floating house. And by simple, I mean it has only a few parts. It's very important though. Its condition has a huge impact on the value of a floating home. It's the foundation of a floating house. So what you might see on land is a pier and beam system or some houses are built on a slab, for example. A floating home is built on a float. Under floating houses, there are two main types of a float. One type of a float is made out of logs and stringers. The logs are Douglas fir logs that are planed down to make a nice level surface for putting stringers on top. The stringers run perpendicularly across the tops of the logs. Stringers are structural beams. Usually they're ACZA pressure treated beams or they are steel. The other main type of a float that is financeable by the three lenders in the Portland area is a concrete float. I would guess that concrete floats make up about 2-4% to of the total number of floats under floating homes in and around Portland. There are a couple other types of floats. There are floats that are called topper floats. Believe it or not, some people have built floating homes on top of tires with flotation underneath. Some people have built floating homes on pontoons where they've built holes, sometimes three or four under a floating home made out of marine grade plywood. Some floating homes have been built on barges. So a barge like what you would see going down the river being pushed by a tug. Some people have built floating homes on those. Those are not financeable though. If you want to get a loan to buy a floating house, the floating house is going to have to be on either a log and stringer float or a concrete float. Another main component of a float is the flotation underneath the logs. Flotation is rectangular in shape. When it goes into the river before the river puts all of its muddy, scuzzy stuff on to the flotation over time, it looks like a rectangular two foot by two foot by four foot marshmallow. Really it's expanded polystyrene wrapped in vinyl. Each piece of flotation gives buoyancy to about 850 pounds. Under an average size floating home, there typically would be around, let's say, 120 to 140 pieces of flotation. If you learn anything at all today from this video, please like it and subscribe to the channel to see property tours of floating homes, tours of floating home mortgages, and also to learn more about floating homes. Besides the main parts, that is the logs, stringers, and pieces of flotation, there's another part that is very important. That is how the stringers are connected to the logs. In the case of pressure treated stringers, those are connected by way of a two foot shear pin that goes down through the tops of the stringers and to the logs. Those are about five eighths of an inch in diameter. New pressure treated stringers last a very long time. I get this question a lot. And what I mean by a very long time is a float inspector a few years ago who has since retired told me that he'll never see these stringers replaced in his lifetime when he was looking at my float which had just been rebuilt a few years before that with ACZA pressure treated stringers and Douglas fir logs. He said the last 50 plus years. The last main thing that's a part of the float is how it's connected to the dock. On the upriver side that is, aside from which the water flows out towards the ocean, there should be two chains that connect the house to the dock. The chain goes around a couple of the logs underneath the dock and connects to the top or the side of the outside log of the float. On the downriver side, there's one chain. Also, on the back of the house, the dock side, there's typically what is referred to as a spring chain. Those chains are tightened up so the connection of the house is tight to the dock pretty much. I mean, there's a little bit of play. What you want to have too between the dock and the house is what's called a bumper log. That log is not always the prettiest of logs. It is 
kind of homely from time to time, but that's okay. What it does is it acts as a spacer between the house and the dock so the house doesn't bump into the dock. Every now and then I get the question, how does everything float? Well, as I mentioned, the houses are connected to the docks. The docks are connected to the bottom of the river. And what I mean by that is there are pilings that go down into the bottom of the river and the docks are connected to those pilings by way of a U bracket. Sometimes it's a rectangular bracket in shape. It goes around the piling and is connected to the dock. So as the river level goes up and back down, which it does twice a day in the Portland area, the docks float, the houses float, and they all stay connected to the pilings, which are connected to the bottom of the river. And then of course, the ramp is connected to land. The ramps that you walk up and down to get to the docks, to get to the floating homes are all connected to land. In addition to the parts of the float, the float inspector also typically looks at what is referred to as a word, which I don't like to hear, so I'm not even gonna say it here in this video, but it's a waste transfer pump and a holding tank. Imagine you're in the kitchen and I'm not going to give you any other visuals that I could, but you could think of on your own if you want to. But imagine you're in the kitchen running water, clean water into a clean sink that runs out through a waistline. Where does it go? It goes into a holding tank. And when that tank is full enough, then the pump turns on, pumps the water out of the tank through a backflow prevention device into the system owned and operated by the moorage. That system is a waste transfer system and has a series of pumps that pumps the waste through a waistline up the ramp, the side of the ramp that is, out onto land, usually into a public sewer system, or sometimes if it's out in the country into a septic system. There actually are a couple of floating home mortgages that have their own wastewater treatment plant. So the quick summary is the float inspector will check out the logs to make sure they're not too old. There are more details that I'll go into here in just a minute about the logs and the stringers and what they'll actually do to check those out. The float inspector also is going to look at what the freeboard is. And what that is, is the average distance underneath the bottoms of the stringers to the top of the water. Generally, they're going to want to see that the freeboard is four to six inches. If the float is riding a little bit too low or it's riding low on one side, that's not a huge deal. You can either have a contractor come out and adjust the floats underneath the float itself. So the pieces of flotation or have flotation added as needed. To give you an idea of what that costs around 2023 and 2024, it's roughly about $150 or so to have one piece of flotation put underneath the house. Like I mentioned earlier, under an average size floating house, you'll see somewhere around 120 to about 140 pieces of flotation. Well, not literally see, but you know what I mean. Under an average size floating house, you'll probably see around eight logs. If it's a little bit bigger of a house, it could be 10 or 12 and in the case of a large house those need to be large enough in diameter they cannot be skinny logs such as a telephone pole size log there are stringers on the tops of the logs those run perpendicularly across the tops of the logs and are spaced out on average about four feet apart from each other the float inspector is going to look at all that and then also the float inspector will look at how much rot there is on the tops of the logs. If there's too much rot and there's rot underneath the stringers, the float inspector will specify almost for sure that the rot will have to be chipped away and then shims will be put in between the stringers and the logs to make the connections solid again. The float inspector also is going to look at the logs themselves and make sure that there's good, useful, solid material in the logs. I heard of a case a handful of years ago where the logs actually looked really good from the outside. And then the float inspector was actually, with not much force whatsoever, able to push a foot long screwdriver into the logs because they were so old and spongy. Those logs ended up getting replaced. The process by which rot is formed on the tops of logs is oxidation. The tops get wet, but they also dry out too and rot forms. The part of the logs underneath the water though get pretty well preserved over time. 
there are some logs in this area that are huge in diameter. They were salvaged from the coast range from a series of forest fires referred to as the Tillamook Burn. That was a series of four forest fires spread out from 1933 through 1951. Some of those logs under the floating homes in and around the Portland area are huge. They're very large in diameter. You'll know them when you see them. They're absolutely enormous. Those logs actually are large enough in diameter that they can be used for quite a while, a very long time. After shim work is done, so the rod on the tops of the logs is chipped away, shims are put in between the stringers and the logs, and then after more rot forms, and then that job is done again, and then the, basically the tops of the logs that have been exposed to the air over time and water get to be too old. The logs are so big in diameter that in some cases they are flipped around 180 degrees. They're rolled, that is, 180 degrees. And the part that was underneath the water now goes top side up and continues to let the log be used as a log under a floating house. Call me anytime if you have any questions about floating homes in and around the Portland area. Or if you want to see some floating homes, of course, subscribe to the channel to learn more about floating homes. I work on land too. Call me anytime.